It all started two or three weeks ago. I was watching Sovereign Dev's stream, and we were talking about, like, foliage interaction and blah, 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 blah. One of my favorite topics to, uh, to talk about. And we were chatting about my old landscape interaction system, uh, which I made back in Unreal Engine 4. And, you know, it was using, like, tessellation, and it was using a scene capture. And, you know, looking back on it, it is one of my most popular videos, but I do feel like it is very dated. So it kind of got me thinking, what is a better way that we can keep all of the, you know, the unique functionality of that system, but somehow get rid of the, the scene capture entirely and just, you know, make it as performant as possible. So as you can probably guess, we are going to be doing this all within a shader. Now, let me first explain how the old system operated uh, in, in a very quick manner. So let's say this is our character. They're just chilling on a landscape. And what we were essentially doing is we had a, a camera that was underneath, you know, the, the world. And it was looking up at our character. And it was essentially doing a, a depth pass and a custom depth pass. So the first depth pass would capture, you know, the, the landscape, the height of the landscape. And the custom depth pass would capture the depth of essentially anything that was assigned to it. So that being a character. Uh, and then what we would do is we would compare the distance of the character to the landscape and where the character was touching the landscape or was close to touching the landscape. We would then print that to a render target. And that was the gist of it. Now, the big downside of that system was this bad boy, the scene capture, the SC. Now, why don't we like scene captures? Well, for one, a scene capture has to set up an entire render pass because it's actually rendering the objects in the scene. So it's rendering the mesh, it's rendering the material. Even if the, you know, the field of view is like really small, and we have like a, a show only list. So it's only gonna render the character and the landscape or anything that's assigned to it. The initial overhead of setting up that scene, regardless of the size, is quite significant. So the new idea that I came up with was to absolutely get rid of our, our scene capture. Instead, what we would do is we would define some shapes on, you know, the character or the, the mesh or the whatever. And we would draw them in a material comparing against a height RVT, a height runtime virtual texture. So with the sort of premise all figured out and how it was going to work and whatever, I, I got to work. Gamers. <laughs> The first thing that we're going to be doing, we're actually going to be going to uh, edit. We're going to go to plugins. I'm going to hit add. So the first thing that I needed to figure out was how do I draw a capsule in a shader? Well, I know how to draw a sphere in a shader. So let me, let me show you how that works. Right, let's just jump into a blank material. Bam, full screen. Enhance. So the way that we're going to be drawing these spheres, we're actually going to be drawing them as circles. So from the top down and then comparing it against the, the height map, you know, underneath it. Um, so what we start with is a point. So our point, uh, this represents zero in the middle, I believe, in this in this view space. So like if we were doing world position um, and we got X, Y, then we would see right in the middle is zero, zero. Um, you can actually see there's like a really small gradient uh, right there. And that's going from zero to one in the positive 
red direction or X direction. And then down, there's a gradient going to positive green. Um, and then the black is in the negatives. We can't see the negatives because you just you can't see negative colors. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to take this grid of positions and we are going to compare the distance of zero. So we're going to get position zero. We're going to get distance, bam. And we're going to do, well, that there. Cool. We hit that into the base color. And you can see we have a tiny, tiny little dot in the center. Uh, and this is just saying at zero, zero, the distance is zero. And then in any direction from that, we have a distance of one. And then anything beyond that is greater than one. That's why it's all white. But if we were to divide this by some number, let's say 20, put that into there, then you can see that this dot gets bigger because this point where the gradient ends used to be 20, but now it is one because we've divided everything by 20. So this is the, this is the beginnings of drawing a sphere. Uh, let's bump this up to 50. Cool. So if we get this, we one minus it and we chuck into the base color, you can see we have a white circle. Uh, now, one other thing that we need in order for this to actually be useful is the the vector field. So the way we can get that is by getting the world position, subtract this one, and if we put that into the base color and normalize it, you can see that we have this nice kind of rounded uh, circular thing. So if we then multiply this by that, we now have a, if I was smart enough to clamp this, <laughs> uh, we now have a, a vector field. So this is a circle and pointing out from the center, it's denoting the directions in like a, a, you know, a radial arrangement. If we wanted to view this so that we could actually see what's going on in this top corner, we could just get this, add one, divide by two, which will just remap the the range from negative one to one to zero to one. Uh, and, and then this is our result. You might actually be familiar with what this is looking like because this is what a normal map looks like. Ta-da, this is, you know, it looks like a normal map texture. So we've got our, our circle shape, We've got a, a vector field from that circle shape. The other thing that I wanted to do with this system over the, the previous system was to be able to draw the direction or the velocity of what was being drawn. So that like things like, um, like grass can bend over, you know, as something travels over it, it can bend in that direction. So we can just get, you know, a velocity red. We're moving in the red direction and just multiply that color by the mask. And then we're gonna be left with a, a red circle. So you can imagine this will be like changing as we as we like go around, you know, blah, 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 the velocity changes. So we're gonna be drawing different colors to the map. And then the other other thing that we can do is actually blend the vector field and the velocity together. Now, one other other thing that was going to be really important is be able to change the radius depending on the color channel that we're drawing to. So if we instead use a, a vector value for our divider, you know, to get our radius, uh, what we're left with is actually uh, we've got our R and G radius at 50 and our blue radius at 10. You can see that oops, you can see that in the middle. There's this white section uh, where they're all overlapping and whatnot. So the reason I wanted to be able to do this is because when our character is going to be, you know, walking around and falling over and rolling around and whatever, we kind of want the foliage to react from a little bit further away. So like when their foot presses down on some grass, the grass will kind of look like it's pressing against other blades of grass. 
and you know have like a, a more like smooth gradient whereas for the blue channel we want it to be more you know conforming to the shape of the character and by doing it this way we only have to do one pass of the entire system we don't have to do a you know a sand and mud pass and a grass and foliage pass and a you know whatever else we wanted to do right now the last piece of this puzzle is comparing it to a height map uh, so for example let's just say we have a, a linear gradient which is just going to be our text coord so if we have a look here you can see that we're starting at zero and then this is uh, one over here let's multiply this by a hundred so that this is 100 on this side. I know you can't really see it. Uh, we'd have 50 in the middle and then zero over this side. So imagine this is like a hill on our, on our terrain or something. So what we need to do now is actually get our location, but it's going to be a 3D vector. Uh, so we're going to have a blue, you know, position now. And then with this blue value, we can do distance. So we can say, okay, what's the distance to the point uh, that we're sampling? So let's just say this is getting the RG uh, and we're going to add that to the text coordinates and put that into there. Uh, and then this, you know, just imagine this is our, our height runtime virtual texture. We're going to get this, we're going to get distance and then uh, we're going to multiply the end result by this thing. And that should also be saturated. Uh, let's also just add that, you know, we want this to start being active when it is, I don't know, 30 units from the, the landscape. So you can see now that absolutely nothing is being drawn. But if we start to increase the, the Z height of our shape, so we'll put it up to 30 can see you know it's looking uh, it's looking good put it up to 50 it's basically the same strength as it was and then as we start to go above 50 it will start fading out again if we go up to 100 it's going to be completely gone so this is going to be our method for determining when to draw these shapes to the render target so we're essentially sort of faking a, a depth pass by doing this comparison so that's going to be how we're drawing the characters to the render target without the use of a scene capture. However, you'll probably remember that I said I was going to use capsules instead of circles or spheres. Now, capsules are... Uh, I mean, there's some similarities and there's some very big differences. So let me just yeet this away. And I'll set up how we draw a capsule and then I'll kind of run you through it. Oakley McDoakley, let me run you through how a capsule works. We start with our two positions and our coordinates and we subtract position one from the coordinates and then we subtract position one from position two. Then we get the dot product of the coords minus position one dotted against the position two minus position one and then we divide that by the vector length squared of position two minus position one uh, and so what that gives us is a nice gradient from zero to one um, from position one to position two. And that gradient can really come in handy when we want to lerp between, for example, different colors on either end of the capsule um, or different radiuses on either end of the capsule. Um, so essentially when we do our radius, which is just getting that distance divided by some number, we're actually changing the value that we are dividing by as we go along the capsule. Now, if we grab this value here, you can see that we have a nice vector field. And once we normalize that, bam, normalize, then we have a nice capsular shape 
Now, for me, because I use just the length itself to do some stuff, I'm manually normalizing it. So in order to normalize a vector, we just get the length of that vector and then divide the vector by its own length. And that, that gives us the, you know, the unit vector. So if we just got that normalized vector and multiplied it by our capsule shape, then we can see that we are left with our vector field. And if we just remap that, add one, divide by two, oh, divide by two, divide by two, then we have a beautiful looking normal map for our capsule. So then the last thing that we want to do is get the vertical positions of these two capsule positions, and we can lerp between them using that same, you know, uh, gradient. And then we can compare that to the height map like we did with the, uh, with the circles. So I'd figured out all of the math and, you know, how we're actually gonna be drawing these shapes onto the render target. The next thing I had to figure out was how do we actually know where to draw these shapes? Now, this one's actually a bit simpler than drawing the shapes themselves. The first thing that I did was I created a manager actor. It's just going to sit in the world, you know, just chilling. Um, and it is going to be executing all of the funky stuff that we're going to do. So it's going to set up all of our render targets, it's going to create all of the dynamic material instances, it's going to do blah, 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 blah. And then on tick, it is going to be the one that is, you know, running all of the, the draw operations and stuff. And so the process was going to be that this was going to gather all of the shapes, then draw it to all the buffers and do any other extra stuff that we, you know, needed it to do. So the easiest way to get all of the shapes that we wanted to draw was to create a component called the Prismatoscape Draw Component. And what it's going to do is on begin play, it's just going to look for that, that manager class uh, and it's going to set a reference to it. And then whenever we want to start drawing from this component, we just say to the manager, hey, we're going to add ourself to your list of, you know, components to, to look through whenever we update the render target. And then the only other thing I needed to do on this parent class component was have a function called get deform shapes, and it is going to return, you know, the, the shapes that we wanted to draw. You can see here I've got it as spheres and capsules, but you'll see later why having two different types is going to become cumbersome. So then essentially when we gather all shapes, we literally just iterate through the, you know, active components. I'd probably do a, like a distance check in here just for some like early culling. So it would be, you know, get owner, get actor location, um, get the location of the character that we're following. You can see I've already actually done it here. Uh, and then the maximum distance. So if the thing that we're trying to draw is off, you know, it, like it isn't going to appear on the render target, we're not even going to bother adding it to, you know, our list. And then we just get the shapes and we yeet them into just a big list. And then we iterate over that list when we draw the thing. So defining these shapes is actually the, the simplest part of this entire process. Now, where things start to get a little bit uh, dubious and a little bit makes my inner optimizer cringe. So you remember when we were drawing these shapes, um, you know, I was, I was showing you how we draw like capsules and stuff. You'll notice that we're only drawing one of them. And ideally we'd want to be drawing up to and maybe more than a hundred at a time. So we are presented with multiple options. Option one is we get our, you know, draw capsule function and we, we just slap it in, you know, X amount of times in a shader uh, with all of the, you know, all the parameters named and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we literally just add them all together and 
you know, pop them out the output and that's what we're going to draw to the render target. And then option two would be to draw one shape to the render target, then draw another shape to the render target, then another one to the render target, so on, so on, until we've drawn all of the shapes. And then the third option is a combination of the two. So we have X amount of slots in our material and we can draw multiple passes of those slots. So at the time I decided to go with number three, uh, you know, a combination of both. And you know, everything was working quite swimmingly. Uh, so you can see here, I've got some some debug shapes that are just, you know, mirroring what we're doing in the, uh, in the material. And as I start, you know, running around and doing my thing, you can see that the foliage is bending in the direction that we're moving or that, you know, the shapes are moving. Um, and, you know, if I start rolling around, it's going to be accurate to the character. And if I, you know, fall over, it's, it's still going to be drawing properly. And I decided that if the velocity is going downward, uh, that's when we start to blend in that, that vector field that we defined um, earlier. So if I like jump up and hit the ground, um, you can see that the grass moves out omnidirectionally from some of the shapes. And then at the same time, you can see that the the, you know, drawing to the sand or, you know, the, the kind of surface deformation stuff is a lot thinner than the deformation of the grass. Uh, and this is because I am defining different radii for the different channels that we're drawing to. So all of this interaction here is coming from one render target. We'll have a little look at it right now. So we can see as we start running around and, you know, being a character in a video game, uh, we are drawing to this render target. So if we only look at the R and G channels, then you can see that as we move in each different direction, the, the overall color changes. Um, but as our feet hit the ground, you can see there's like a, there's a hint of a vector field in there. And if I, for example, jump up and land, then you can see that the vector field is stronger. So as the, the Z velocity is greater, the vector field gets drawn more. And so if I just like fall down, you can see there's the shape of a human person, uh, much like myself. And, you know, it corresponds to what the, the grass is doing. Uh, now, if we just look at the, the blue channel or the alpha channel, you can see that we're doing some different kind of logic in here. So this is meant for the, uh, the sand and mud and snow and that kind of stuff. Um, and as the Z velocity increases, in this case, we do like a sort of, um, we run what we're drawing through a sine wave um, so that the, the gray values become positive values. Uh, and that way we get like some kind of mounding around the, uh, the footsteps and stuff. So one cool thing about this is that it sort of prevents us from like 100% deforming the, uh, the ground. So even though this bit here is like flattened out, um, we're still going to be making changes to it as we walk on top of it because we're drawing positive values as well as negative values to the thing. So this sort of allows it to just get messier and messier over time, which is really nice, um, as opposed to how we did it previously, where it would kind of just flatten out and look really um, unnatural as, you know, as time goes on. Now, on top of the you know, foliage and surface deformation stuff, I decided, okay, why don't we do, why don't we just chuck in a freaking wind simulation? Um, so you can see here that when I jump, I'm creating like these little air puffs, which are a vector field. And that is, you know, affecting the, the grass and stuff. Now I've gone ahead and upped the, the wind strength by like 10 of what it was before. So we can like really see what's, what's going on. Um, but you can see it's essentially the same as the deform stuff, except we manipulate the render target over time by taking the direction 
Um, so you can see we've got the, the direction and we basically use the previous render target's color to distort the current render target's position. And that, that kind of, you know, creates that directional flow. So if I just like move in this direction or like, you know, thrust in this direction, you can see that, you know, the wind is actually traveling in the direction that we've specified. And then I'm just rotating that very slightly over time. And that kind of creates the, um, uh, the sort of swirls and whatnot. Um, and you know, this can be used for a lot of things, um, explosions and like gunfire and, you know, just little things like when we jump and land just to create some, you know, more dynamic foliage and stuff. And I've also gone and referenced this render target in the sand shader and just done it so it like flattens the normals slightly. So you can see it kind of looks like we're blowing up sand around the place. We're just adjusting the strength of the normal map by using the length of this value. Right, and then last but not least, we also use those deform shapes to run a water simulation. Now, this method was, I think, first done by Ryan Brux, or at least first, you know, he, he was the first one that made a tutorial on how to do, like, water ripple propagation. Um, I've added a bit of noise to mine just so there's, like, more micro ripples and stuff. Um, a cool little thing about it is that it does work with reflecting um, off of surfaces, so the ripples actually, like, interact with, you know, the, uh, the shoreline and anything else that would be in the water, uh, including these shapes themselves. And the way this works is that the, the B channel is just a, like a height map. Um, so we use that to do some world position offset. And then the R and G channel is just a, a normal map generated from that height map using like a very simple normal calculation. Um, now this is also accurate to the character, which is really cool. And you know, some cool things that I've done is when you are, or when something is moving through the water, it builds up the water in front of, you know, the object uh, and dips it down behind them. And then that gets propagated through the, uh, the rippling thing. But if something's moving vertically, um, we do a vector field instead. Um, so you can see here, we're doing a vector field and then it gets propagated out and it, you know, it looks really cool. Uh, it's a little bit jittery because of some of the logic, you know, of, um, having it move around with the player. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll fix that at some point. Um, but otherwise it is, it's a very, it's a very nice sim. So you're probably thinking, okay, well, when can I get this plugin? Uh, and you know, is there, is that it? Is there anything wrong with it? Like, why does the video still have, you know, a bit of time left to go? So the whole time that I'd been, you know, sort of getting towards the end of, you know, creating this, this plugin, I'd sort of been like, you know, battling internally. It kind of just felt like I was fighting against the limitations of, you know, materials in Unreal Engine, um, because you know, I had to like have these like manual batches of like 10, you know, shape slots. And then like, what if I wanted to combine capsules and spheres and, you know, drawing planes and drawing cubes potentially, or, you know, square, squareoids. I don't know what the fuck they're called. Rectoids. That sounds like a disease, but you know, imagine we have them and we have to have 10 slots of each of them in the material, but then we want to draw, you know, 20 capsules and, you know, less than 10 of the other or none of the other. So we'd have to have like all these combinations of different materials and like, you can kind of just see, you know, where I'm going with this. We'd have to have like, if we wanted to have up to a hundred shapes per pass, it's sort of, it's going to scale really, really poorly. And so I thought to myself, who better to ask about a, you know, drawing a bunch of shapes to render targets and doing simulations and stuff than AK, the creator of Fluid Ninja, which is a very, very high fidelity, 
high performance, flexible, you know, plug-in suite that I think everyone will have seen videos on, you know, if you work with Unreal Engine. And so I sent him a message asking, you know, do you have any like hot tips? Like what's, what's the secret sauce to having, you know, so many interactable shapes and stuff. Uh, and what he told me next would cue the dramatic music, change everything. So I hope to see you in the next video where we will be talking about moving this entire system to the Niagara 2D grid uh, paradigm, as AK calls it. One of the main things about the Niagara 2D grid, you know, system uh, is that it supports arrays and arrays are something that materials just do not support at all, you know, like like dynamic arrays. It, it, it's just, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm kind of scared, but uh, I hope to see you all then. And I hope you are all looking forward to the release of this little, little system out into the world. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Uh, <laughs> and a big thanks to all of the patrons for your ongoing support. You guys are very, very special. All of my patrons with a lifetime pledge of like $10 or more are going to receive this plugin free of charge. So if you would like to join them, you can do so for as little as $1 per month uh, in the schnibbly. And with that, we say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>